I'll let some folks get up on here before I get going tonight. Some people join in. Oh. That's some bad lighting tonight, it looks like. I got a lamp that I usually use over there for lighting that broke on me last week, so the lighting might be a little off. Sorry about that. Learn you something. Well, first thing I'm going to learn you is um, I'm here to teach you something. It's your job to learn. My job to teach it. <laughs> Not sure how much I'm actually going to teach, so. Finishing up a couple of texts. This is 24-7 for me here. Give me just a second. I thought I had this done before I went on, but obviously not. All right. Rest of them can wait. <sighs> evening, 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 people. How's everybody doing on this wonderful Thursday evening? It is Thursday, right? I hope so. I'm so glad for it to be Friday. Uh, a little bit to go over tonight. As y'all see by the title, we're going to look at some connecting rod links tonight, and we'll kind of go over, you know, the pros and cons of, um, you know, different rod links, you know, how it helps you, you know, where it benefits you, um, you know, type of engines it's going to benefit in better, you know, longer, shorter rod lengths and stuff. Um, this is, a, you know, something that a lot of people talk about, a lot of people argue about. Uh, I'm not going to you know sit on here and say that you know the way i do it or my opinions or how i build is the absolute law but i'm just going to give you um what i've learned about rod lengths and how i apply them to my builds um if you vary off of that then you know if it works for you that's great but this is just the way i do it um uh, what i'm going to be using tonight or you know rods that we use in the you know the Honda clone style engines. Um, I've got some rods for the Predators also, but um, we're going to be looking at basically the Honda and clones tonight. Uh, of course, here this is our basic 6270 rod for the Honda clone um, standard length. This is you know the same length of rod that you know comes in the engine, you know, 3.03. .03. Um, Sound like my son was choking on something in there. I just want to give me a second to make sure he's all right. But, um, yeah, standard length rod. It comes in the clone. I also have with me tonight, uh, this is what our, our one of our drop-in rods. Uh, we use these with the Wiseco pistons. Um, we get a lot of calls um, with people wanting Wiseco pistons that go on the stock rod. Um, they do not make a Wiseco piston that works with the stock length rods. As you notice, these two rods have very different wrist pin holes. You know, this is a standard stock size wrist pin hole, which comes, you know, OEM in your engine. And this is for the wise cut. This is what's called a 490 wrist pin. The wrist pin is, you know, 490 thousandths. You can literally insert this wrist pin into the stock one. <laughs> That's how much smaller it is. And then they fall on the floor. See the wrist pins in there. These are small enough to actually go inside the stock one. So there's no way that a Wiseco piston that's made today, you know, will work on these stock rods. Uh, we get a lot of calls on that. There's a lot of confusion. I'm hoping to kind of clear some of that up tonight. Um, rod lengths. As you see, these two rods here are the same overall length, basically. The difference in them is the wrist pin. As I just showed you, the wrist pin for the Wiseco is half the size of the one that's in the stock, the OEM uh, wrist pin. The reason the wrist pins are smaller is because of the pistons that they go on. You know, this is a Wiseco piston. It takes the 490 wrist pin. It, that's what this rod goes to. Um, when you lengthen out this rod, you have to shorten up the piston. That's the only way to make it work. 
Uh, you hear the phrase a lot. Everybody talks about I've got a stroker rod or I put a stroker long rod in it. Technically, there is no such thing as a stroker rod. Um, when you put a longer rod, shorter piston on your crankshaft, the stroke is the same. The only thing that changes the stroke in an engine is the actual crankshaft. This is a stock OEM clone crankshaft. That's the only thing that changes the stroke. And you do that by going to one of our billet stroker crankshafts. Um, the only thing that when you change this rod length and go to a longer rod, shorter piston, you're changing what's called the rod ratio. And that's the ratio of you know the length of the rod, time stroke, and ideal, that's something that's argued a lot also, was what is ideal rod ratio? Ideal rod ratio from what I've studied and, and, and was taught is, you know, around, you know, between 1.9 and, and, and 2. When you change the ratio of these rods, going from, yeah, you know, i got one that's on a piston to show you a little bit better. The rods are, you know, basically the same length. The pistons are the same from the crank pin up to the top. But what's different is the longer part of the rod. The rod is longer, the piston shorter. That does a couple of things. It changes the attack, on, you know, the, the push or the angle of the rod angle on the, on the crankshaft. You know, when it's hooked up to the crankshaft, the, the way it pushes on the shaft, it gives a different angle. And as it comes up and down, uh, the way it the way it pushes on the crank, I'm, something's going on with my son in there. That's why I'm kind of not really in my, my right mind right now. He's coughing really bad. I don't know what's going on, but I may have to go in there for a second. But anyway, the way the rod angle pushes on the crankshaft, this short rod right here. <laughs> I'm sorry. This this might be a very interrupted video tonight. But, um... This short guy right here, as the piston is being pushed down in the cylinder, has a, a, a you know, it'll have a steeper angle. This one puts more leverage on the crankshaft. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, let me get back to my train of thought here. Puts more leverage on the crankshaft. Not only does it, you know, change the angle and put more leverage, but you get a lighter package on the top of the rod. You know, this this connecting rod with the smaller wrist pin and the you know the shorter piston, on average, is about between 25 and 30 percent lighter than what this is so you get a lighter package you get um different rod angles which you know puts different pressure crankshaft that leads to horsepower um can you make a lot of horsepower with these standard length rods and pistons yes people do it all the time um but when with a lighter package lighter piston lighter wrist pin longer ratio you know, different angles of attack on the on the on the crank. Um, all that equals to horsepower. It's, it's, this is simple drop-in horsepower. Um, another big thing that it does is it changes the dwell time at the top and the bottom of the cylinder. You know, as this longer rod and shorter piston goes around, you know, the piston as it goes to the top, you know, to compress or or you know push the exhaust gases out. It'll kind of, right as the pist uh, crankshaft gets the top dead center and starts going over, it kind of pauses for milliseconds. I mean, we're talking split seconds here. Um, it slows the piston down, and then it stops, and then it slowly picks back up speed. It does the same thing at the bottom. It increases the dwell time at the top and the bottom. This shorter rod here, as the piston gets to the top, you know, it has you know, less dwell which means it stops quicker and it starts quicker. It's a more violent action. Um, you'll get you know, high RPM engines. You know, I, I don't recommend anything but the Wiseco and the Long Rod because of you know, the dwell time. It slows down at top and the bottom. That violent act of stopping the piston and starting it again, stopping it and starting it again, is lessened with the Long Rod and the Wiseco. Therefore, it adds a little bit of durability to the engine, you know, as far as how much pressure is being put on the crankshaft, how much, you know, uh, uh, pressure is being put on the side cover and the block from it starting and stopping. Because that's what creates crankshaft flex. When that crankshaft is spinning around, 
and it got piston goes to the top, especially on the on the uh, exhaust stroke where it's pushing the exhaust gases out. There's nothing stopping that piston at all except the connecting rod. That's what's holding it in the block from going out the top. You know, on the other stroke, you've got compression. You're compressing the fuel up, so that's slowing the piston down. But on the exhaust stroke, nothing stopping it but the rod. And when that thing goes to the top and stops the rod and comes back down, that makes this crankshaft flex in like that. Same thing with the bottom. When it goes down, it stops the piston and goes back up, it causes the crankshaft to flex this way. So this crankshaft, all the time the engine's running, is flexing up and down. And um, with this piston long rod you know, combo, you get a little less of the violence starting and stopping. You know, along with, you know, mainly because of the lighter weight piston and, and you know, longer ratios and stuff, it um, just helps the dwell time. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of out of it tonight. Um, I've had some things going on. I've got stuff on my mind, and I'm just not really into this tonight, as y'all can kind of tell. Um, just different things going on. But as um, far as these long rod combinations, uh, I'm going to go over kind of a couple of different we, combinations we got. We got two. Uh, we got what's called our drop-in rod, which is what a lot of people use. And we designed this rod to be used with the wise codes, you take them right out the box, you make sure your clearances are right on your cylinder, you make sure your ring gaps are right, you make sure your uh, rod journal clearances are right, and you just basically drop it in. There's nothing else to do. Just as you know, standard, you know, get and go right out the box. Um, a lot of people use that. It's, it, it's, it's a real good combination. Um, I use it a lot. I use it a lot more than I do the longer rod. Um, which is this one that you actually got to cut the piston on. The the longest rod we got is the 3.707. It um you'll have to cut 80 to 90 thousandths off the top of the piston. It'll actually stick out the block, and you'll have to uh, machine the top of the piston off. Well, we done that so that you can have the longest ratio available. You know, the longer your ratio is, the less stress it puts on the crankshaft, and the less stress it puts on the block. Um, the more dwell time you get and the more power it makes. You know, these, these Wiseco drop-ins, on average, with just moderate modified builds, you know, I've seen as much as a horsepower increase just by installing that piston and rod, doing nothing else um, over the, you know, the standard length um, OEM style pistons. And this is actually a Hemi piston here, if you notice. The Hemi pistons are really good pistons. They're, they're built very durable. And I've turned these pistons you know, 9,000 plus many times, never had a problem with them. Um, but there again, you got that shorter ratio. Um, it just, it won't make as much power pound for pound. If they're built identical and all you do is change the pistons rod, you're going to make more power with these most of the time. Um, but that's one of the easiest things you can do to, you know, helping to make, you know, more power in your engine um, just by installing it. You know, the little drop in. I'll give part numbers here in a few minutes about, you know, what these do. And again, sorry I'm really not into it tonight. I'm just kind of scatterbrained and got a lot of other things in my mind. I literally ain't been home long. Uh, got a lot of stuff going on real busy. This is kind of a last minute video that I was going to do, just kind of off the wall type things. Um, but, uh, Kind of getting back to the to the ratio thing um if you're going to build high high rpm engines you're going to turn these things you know 8500 and some people for some reason don't think that they're making any power unless they're turning them 9000 plus you know you're going to need to go with a wise co and the long rod you know i recommend the drop in um it's a part number uh for the honda clone is a 6234 and the connecting rod for the Predator is a 6236. Um, we got pistons that go in the clone for stock bore is a 111.32 PS, and the Predator stock bore is a 111.32 P94. Um, highly recommend the drop in. It's easy. You get longer rod ratios. You get to use a smaller wrist pin. You know, you get all the benefits of the long rod ratio, lightweight piston without the extra machine work and the longer rod which is 3.707 possibly you know it does make a little little bit more power but that little bit 
you know, sometimes isn't worth it unless, you know, you got the machinery cut the piston down because you have to actually mock everything up, you know, measure how far out the hole the piston is, you know, to get it machined right. And um, that's a little more of a builder's thing, but a lot of DIYers use it. They get their pistons cut at machine shops or, you know, they have a way to cut them themselves. But, you know, the little drop-in combo is, is widely, widely used, and I use it a whole lot myself. Now, a lot of people, you know, have gotten in trouble with the long rod combos because they're using them in blocks that have been decked a lot. And if that block has been decked a whole bunch and you got to cut more than a hundred thousandths off top of that piston, I don't recommend using the 3707 because the more you cut that piston, here, that one right here, the more, well, actually, no, not that one. The more you cut off top of this piston, the less material you have, you know, as far as that, you know, the dome of the piston, it gets thinner. And with these, with high RPMs, with it being thin up here, the piston will actually try to flex, you know, because there's not much material up here holding it. And even though the longer rod is slowing down the piston a little bit, adding to the dwell time and this, that, and the other, you're still going to get a little bit of piston flex and that can lead to piston failure it can also lead to wrist pin failure if you're not using a heavy duty pin and you know a lot of people don't use heavy duty pins i do we sell good heavy duty pins and I always have but with that piston if you cut it too thin it can start flexing and cause wrist pin problems with piston failures and it can lead to some pretty catastrophic stuff um so if you don't have ways of cutting it down, and even if you do, you don't don't cut no more than a hundred thousand off the top of these pistons. Um, that, that's why you know we designed the drop in. Easy to do. Anybody can do it. It drops right in, right out the box, and it's a simple, easy horsepower upgrade. Um, now. As far as Wiseco pistons, we've got a new one that we're working with now. I mean, these type of pistons have been out for a long, long, long time. Um, this is nothing new uh, as far as technology, um, but it's something new that we're carrying. Um, and they're only available for the Predator-style engine right now. You know, these Wiseco pistons, when they come, those of you that's used them know that they only got two rings on them. They got you know, a, a top ring, which works as a compression ring and an oil scraper ring. And then it has the standard, you know, three-piece uh, corrugated ring on the bottom. That works well, but with only having one ring on it, sometimes rebuilds are a little quicker than if you was using, you know, an OEM piston with three rings on it. So we now carry for the Predator engines and the drop-in rod only, we carry three-ring Wiseco pistons. They have a ring set, you know, just like a standard OEM piston would do. It's got a top ring, an oil scraper ring, and then an oil uh, corrugated ring on the bottom. A lot better seal and a lot longer lasting seal. Um, you know, the Wiseco two rings, they seal up good. You know, if you do your cylinder work right and you break in right, you get good seal, but that ring wears out a little quicker than three wood. So, like I said, these are for the Predator engines only. Uh, the seven point, I mean, 2.756 bore. Um, we've been using these. I got several engines with these out there. We've had them for a little while, and we've got them on the market now. But like I say, this is nothing new. This technology has been around for years and years. Um, but it's something new that we're doing. Um, but this only works with the drop-in style rod. You cannot machine none of, none of the uh, none of the dome off of it because you'll get down to the ring land. But um, this is a really, really good combination for the Predator engines, the Hemis and the non-Hemis. Um, with the drop-in rod, highly recommend this. Um, I, the part number on that, I believe, is a 17-2756 for the piston. Um, but that's, that's, I um, wish we could get a piston like that to go in our stroker kits and stuff because you have to, with our billet stroker cranks and all, you have to cut the pistons down on so that you know, we made the rod ratio as long as possible, so that wouldn't work in, you know, like our stroker kits unless you put a welded deck plate on top of it or something like that. Um, 
again, sorry, I'm kind of running through this and kind of rambling, but I'm just kind of, um, my mind is somewhere else right now. Um, connecting rods also, I wanted to, I wanted to say this because we've got people out there that I've done videos on this in the past and I've done Facebook posts and all in the past about what connecting rods fit what. Um, we still get people ordering the wrong connecting rods. Not everybody watches these videos, but you know they still order from us. Um, anything, any clone or Honda engine, clone 196 or Honda GX200, they take the same connecting rods. Any Predator 212, Hemi or non-Hemi, they take the same connecting rods. Um, that's why all the connecting rods, as I've said before, they have what engine it is for engraved on it. Now I understand this is going to be backwards because I hadn't upgraded my technology here yet, but that one says Honda on it. That's for a Honda GX200 or a 196 clone. Now, I may not have brought a Predator rod with me. I don't think I did. Huh, my mistake. I thought I had a Predator rod out here. I don't though, but the Predator rods, they'll all say Predator on it right here. It's engraved in it. But a lot of people think that because the Hemi engine takes the clone cams and the clone side cover and top plate, that it also takes the clone rod. It does not. The Hemi and the non-Hemi, generation one, two, or three, they all take the same connecting rod, and that is a Predator connecting rod. Um, that's, that's, for some reason, that's still a, a, a problem um, with people ordering. They order... Uh, they'll read on some forum somewhere that, you know, the Hemi takes everything the clone does. So they'll order a clone rod, and then they'll get the rod, try to put it on their engine, and either wind up, you know, messing up the rod or messing up the crankshaft. They're trying to torque it down, and it won't spin, and they call us up, and they're mad, and, you know, then we got to tell them they got the wrong rod. Um, but um, yeah, anything for the Predator, they all take the same rods. Um, also, our connecting rods, when they go out the door, we have a very small tolerance as far as plus or minus on the size of these rods and um okay now now I can get my mind back in the right place um because Bradley Bush is here I was so worried that he was not going to show up that's why I was kind of scatterbrained this that and the other had a lot on my mind I was worried that my my go-kart hero was not going to show up but he's here now so now I can flip the light switch on and get in my right mind and, and go to it Anyway, <laughs> glad you're here, Bradley. All of our rods have very small tolerances on the wrist pin and on the uh, bearing end. Um, they all go out with very little plus or minuses. So you can just about bet that when you get a rod from us that it's going to be the right size. But I still tell people to check them. Check them on whatever crankshaft you're putting on, whether it's our billet crankshaft and oh jeff's here now too so man my night is made <laughs> look at me i'm smiling for the first time jeff's here yay but um all of our rods come with instructions or they're supposed to if not y'all can blame david simpson on that um but they come with instructions that tell you just like in the rod video i done you know a year or so ago um to tell you how to how to clearance it, how to you know what to check, how to torque it, everything you need to know is right here. But I tell people to check our rods, especially on when they put them on OEM crankshafts, because these things are made in China. I know, big surprise, but believe it or not, <laughs> these stock OEM crankshafts that come in your engines are made in China, and their plus or minus tolerances are way 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 bigger than anything we do um, we dealing in tenths of a thousands actually <laughs> less than tenths of a thousands but um they deal in thousands of an inch as far as plus or minus tolerances but two tools that anybody this building engine really kind of needs to have i'm not saying it's a must but it really helps to have a good set of mics and these are the actual mics that i use here this is one i use on engines every single day and it also helps to have a couple of dial bore gauges and these are standard dial bore gauges you can order um 
you need one for the cylinder and one to check connecting rods with because I'm going to show you why. I grabbed this crankshaft off the shelf literally as I was running out the door a few minutes ago. I've yet to see very, very, very few Predator crankshafts especially come the right size. Now these clone crankshafts, these come from the box stock project. They're BSP crankshafts. They're close. They're a lot closer than anything you're going to get out of these Predator ranges because these crankshafts are built to you know box stock projects you know specification they want them you know really close and they're usually really good i have to do very little work with these box stock project uh crankshafts that's a two shout out to you there jared i want a free t-shirt all right but these journals are ground in china and if this was a Predator crankshaft, I would more than be willing to bet that it would be at least a thousandth too big. Now, a lot of people tell you you got to measure, you know, seven, eight places on these journals. I measure two places. I measure straight up and down if it's a new shaft. Now, if it's been run, I may measure some other places depending on, on you know, how bad it looks. Measure straight up and down. Hmm. That, and that crankshaft's two tenths too big right here. Two tenths of a thousandth. That's pretty good for Chinese, but again, this is a box stock project crankshaft. That's number three, Jared. I want a t-shirt. And it's round. Two tenths out on both sides. That would probably be okay to just build straight out of. You know, maybe do some mild polishing to it, and you'll be fine. But most of these predator crankshafts i've yet to see any come in that was too small most of them are too big that's why you hear people always saying you know we run these box stock predators right out the box and i've blown three or four of them which slung the rods out the first night i run them that's because the rods have too little uh oil clearance on them and that's from the factory these engines are designed to be fired up and run on a generator all day long you know Proper clearances is not that important for that. But when you rev these things up to five, six thousand RPMs, you've got to have proper oil clearances on this connecting rod, or it's gonna break. I don't care if it's a stock rod or one of these. If the clearances are not right, it will break. Um, and we get people quite often with our connecting rods, take them right out of the box, put the bearings in, do everything correctly, torque everything down, but don't check the clearances, and the rods won't spin on the crankshaft. And they'll call us up and we'll go through all the, you know, the questions that we have to ask everybody. You know, do you have the right rod for your engine? You know, I've got a Predator. Okay, well, do you have the right Predator rod? Yes, we do. Once we figure out that all the numbers match, um, that they got the right rod and the right engine, then we ask them, well, what was your clearances? And I didn't check them. Okay, when we bought a rod from you, we expect it to be right. Okay, well, the rod, 99.999% of the time is going to be right. But these crankshafts come big, especially in the Predators. I've seen some as much as three thousandths too big. The rod, the crank, the engine would not even turn when I took it out of the box. I couldn't even put a wrench on it and turn it because the rod was locked down on the crankshaft out of the box. That's Predator engines. Believe it or not, the clones are that way when we first started running them back in the, you know, the Blue Harbor Freight days before Mr. Jimmy Sims and other people come along and really revolutionized little engines and they're the clones are really good engines now i mean i have no problem taking one out of a box and firing it up and going to do something with it i trust them that much but these predators i do not um because they're notoriously big so whether you got an oem rod or one of our billet rods follow the instructions that come with it and check your clearances if you're questioning on how to do that i've got another video that's i made about a year ago um probably a little longer than that it's on it's uh should be on our facebook page here somewhere it's definitely on youtube you go to youtube and just you know look up arc racing on youtube or arc billet rod um it's a video that's not as exciting as these uh, you know i watched them the other day and i'm like wow those are kind of dull <laughs> but i tried to do them production style and make them look all fancy and you know but anyway it explains how to properly put on a rod how to do a plastic gauge check and it shows you how to use these gauges you know dial board gauges um this is one of our rods it's got the bearings in and it's torqued down you know it's 
plastic gauging is as an easy way to do it. A lot of you know car builders still plastic gauge, you know, and I still use it from time to time just to you know to check myself and this that and the other. But uh, plastic gauge is the stuff you buy at auto parts store and you actually you know put a piece of plastic, just a little rubbery plastic stuff you put in between the rod and the crankshaft and torque it down and it spreads it out and then you have a way of measuring it and it tells you how much clearance you got. I'm not going to get into all that now, just you know, go watch my other video and that explains everything on how to do that. But dial bore gauges are the most accurate way to do it, you know, because you actually measure the rod as it's put together, you know, inside the, you know, you got the cap on it and you got the bearings in it and the rod bolts torqued down to at least 160 with oil on the threads and you, you know, measure the inside of the rod with the bearing in it in a couple of three places. You know, make sure everything's good and round and good and seated. Um, then, as I showed you before, you measure the crankshaft. And there again, I only measure two places unless the, you know, the crankshaft looks bad. And you're straight up and down and side to side. And making sure it's round, making sure the measurements are where you need it. And whatever size the rod is to whatever size the crankshaft is, that's how much oil clearance you got. And our rods, every rod I use, I shoot for three thousandths oil clearance. I might get two seven, I might get three point two, um, but I shoot for three thousandths. Minimum on our stuff is two and a half thousandths. Um, but phone's ringing. You can wait. Um. But yeah, I just wanted to you know, kind of go over the connecting rod thing because there again, back to what I first said about them is people still get them confused, you know, and I hear people calling, you know, I got a, a Predator clone engine. No, you don't. You either got a Predator or you got a clone. Once again, I got a video on this that I actually done live probably three months ago, four months ago maybe, um, about Predator and clone. It, it tells all these differences on what fits what and what makes them different. Um, but Honda clone engines take a rod, Hemi Predator, non-Hemi Predator, they all take the same rod. Um, the rods come in instructions. Follow the instructions. If you have a problem after following the instructions, you know, call us up. You know, we're more than happy to talk to you about this stuff. Um, and there again, you know, back to the rod ratio thing. For those of you just joining, you know, high RPM engines. You know, these, in my opinion, the Wiseco long rod are a must. Um, I've run these short rod, you know, actually this one, this is actually the Hemi piston and short rod that come out of, y'all remember my dual engine cart that I had, this was the back engine. The front engine was a stroker, uh, had our billet stroker crankshaft in it. The back engine was a stock stroke, you know, with the uh, Hemi piston in it. Um, so this piston here, yeah, this one's turned 9,000 many times. I used to turn that engine 88, 8900, or those engines, there was two of them. Um, but when it comes down to it, if you want durability and you want your, you know, your, your block fatigue to cut down and your crankshaft fatigue to cut down, um, these long rod Wisecos, longer rod ratios, you get better rod angles, you get better push on the crankshaft. See how much better I'm talking now since Bradley and Jeff are here? You know, before I was just stumbling over myself and babbling and really didn't make much sense, but um, yeah, longer rod ratios better rod angle on the crank, better push on the crank equals better horsepower. And it also helps the wear of the engine better. Um, you know, the, the quick, violent start and stops on these crankshafts wears the crank pretty bad because right here is what catches it all, the bottom part. Um, because every time that, that piston goes up, you know, if the crank comes up and stops it, the bottom part of that crank right there is what, what stops it. You know, the rod's the only thing to stop this from going out. And same thing on the downstroke. When it goes to the bottom, that same area of the crank right there catches everything. That's what wears the most on the crank. And you know, when you go to the long rod, Wiseco, you get lighter stuff, better rod angles, and you get a little bit less wear. It's still going to wear. You're not going to stop wear. You know, these people say, you know, I got a modified engine. I turned 9,000. I've been running for two years, and this ain't wore any. You might need to get some new measurement tools because I promise you it's wearing. Um, but it just it cuts down on it. it, just cuts down on the stress, you know. And anything that makes horsepower plus cuts down on stress and a little bit of wear and tear is always a better thing, always. Um, now that I'm actually 
in my halfway right mind, I'll go back and look at some questions. Uh, if you got a 160 block and you're putting a 212cc uh, Predator crank in it, uh, good luck. <laughs> people, I mean, people have a hard time putting a GX200 crank in it. You know, the 212 one is 40 thousandths longer. I have no idea what rod you put in there. All I can tell you to do is put the 212 crank in it uh, with a GX160 piston. Um, well, one combination you might can use is uh, you might can use the um, the drop-in rod with the the standard two-ring wise code, the P94 piston. That way, because it being a 160 block, the block is shorter. You may can cut some of the top of the piston off. That'd be a combination I'd probably try. Um, but um, never put anything in a 160 block before. But you know, try the drop in for the 212. That's going to be a 6236 rod with a 111 32 P94 piston. That way, you'll have some you can cut off the piston if you have to. So, you'll come up with something 16 Vanguard. Uh, get me the model number of that Vanguard. Um, there's about four different models of that type of engine at 16 horsepower. I need the model number of engine you got. That's the first two numbers. It'll be a model 30, a 31, or a 40. And more than likely, we got a flywheel for that engine. But as far as the connecting rods, I need to know the model number. Yeah, Marvin, I presented it, but I mean, I was, I'm still kind of thinking about other things right now. The Chinese, depending on, well, Jeff, you know, depending on what factory you're in over there, some of the Chinese, I ain't saying it's got great quality control, but as far as these engines coming in now, the box stock project engines and the red engines that Dino's getting, they're, they're tons better than what they used to be. When these engines first started coming over, that's why a lot of people was complaining when the clone first started happening is, man, these things are all over the place. They're up in the hole, they're down in the hole. They got, you know, this one's got, you know, 40,000 longer stroke than this one. This one's got a bigger cam than this one. And that's where Jimmy Sims, you know, that's where he come in and the guys at Dino, they come in and they got their two little engine packages and got them made in places that are not perfect, but a whole lot better than what they used to be. Um, you know, you can take 10 of these engines now and you don't, you know, you can have 10 comparable engines, unlike the Predator. You go out and buy 10 Predator engines, even if you buy all non-Hemis, you're going to have 10 different engines. Um, because I go through Predators all the time. I build a lot of modifies out of Predators. And I'll get one that's 10 in the hole, the next will be 50 in the hole. And this one's got, you know, it's just like the clones used to be. This one's got more stroke. This one's got less stroke. And, you know, but the the box stock projects and the red engines, their quality control is a whole lot better. You know, why you got to bring up the oil crap? Man, that's been weeks ago. Let it go, man. I have all over the racetrack. Solid billet rods. Um, I'm assuming you mean a uh, billet rod without a bearing in it. Um, never do that. Um, if we build rods without bearings in them, they're still going to be a $60 rod that's going to wear out. And when you go to rebuild, you got to buy another $60 rod instead of an $18 set of bearings. You know, these billet rods, if they're, if they're installed right, maintained right, and used right, they'll last you know change the bearings and the bolts every rebuild and they'll keep right on trucking but a solid rod that's what i'm assuming you're talking about Dion, with no bearing uh probably not gonna do that we've got some out there that we built for people but we don't have a lot of them jeff name one thing you've ever corrected that i was wrong on <laughs> besides not tightening the oil plug uh, David, if you want to build a lower compression engine, compression doesn't matter when it comes to rods and, and pistons and rod ratios. Um, a lower compression engine is going to need all the help it can get to make. Um, I guess that's what you mean. You said lower comp engine. I'm just kind of going off what you wrote there. A lower compression engine needs all the help it can get to make power. Um, and a lighter piston combination that's going to be easier to move a uh, longer rod ratio that's going to offer more dwell at the top and the bottom, uh, plus a better rod angle that's going to put you know a better a uh, better push on the crankshaft. It, that's it's, it's all going to be better, high compression or low compression.
Yeah, Robert, the three ring Wiseco would be good in any engine you want to put it in, as long as it's bored to 2756 and we have a rod for it. Um, so you couldn't use it in an animal because we don't have a drop in rod for the animal. We got the, you know, the, the 6248, which is the long rod for the animal. You have to cut the top of the piston off. But it would work in any, any engine that we have a drop in style rod for, it, whether it be a Predator, whether it be a clone or a Honda or the Old Harbor Freight, Greyhounds. Um, yeah, it, it, to me, that's a, that's a pretty dynamite little package there. Uh, a little bit better sealing, a lot longer wearing. Um, I want to talk about something else about these pistons too as I answer a couple more questions here. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I want to doing a turbo for so lower compression. Yeah, and see there again, you're putting this turbo on it. Um, it's going to be lower static compression, but that turbo and EFI, wow, y'all on the ball there. A turbo and EFI, its job is to put more air into the cylinder. The more air you get into the cylinder, the more fuel you can put in there, the bigger bang you have. And you're going to want, you know, a, a longer ratio um, for wear resistance for more durability. Um, it's, it's just going to, you know, the wise code long rod, whether it be the drop in or the, you know, the drop in three ring or the uh, two ring that you, you know, cut with the longer rod is going to be a good combination and fine for that turbo. I would probably go with the three ring since you're going to be using a turbo. You're going to need all the seal help you can get when that turbo starts slinging fuel and air in there. Better to build an animal or a predator? Well, Jason, you can make the same horsepower with an animal, a predator, or a Honda. Um, depending on how modified you're going to do it, I'd start with the Predator, because the Predator comes out of the box a bigger engine. Um, it's got a, about a 75 thousandths bigger bore than a Honda, and a 40 thousandths longer stroke. And it's got, you know, the non-Hemi and the Hemi have good heads on them with bigger valves that you can do head work to, and they flow really good. The head on a Predator or a Honda is going to flow better than, a, you know, the basic animal unless you do a lot of work to it. Um, the animal... Yeah, they can make the same horsepower, but you're going to spend more money on the animal. Um, not down on the animal. Animal's a fine engine. Animal's a good engine. Um, modifieds, they last. You know, they're they're good engines, but it just costs so much more uh, for the parts. Um, but the Predator, to me, I start with the Predator. Either weld the Predator up, you know, weld the blocks, weld some gussets on it. With a billet side cover and, and you know board a predator to you know two eight one five or something like that and but it really doesn't matter as far as animal predator it's all about price and availability um, to me because you can make them all make the same horsepower. You're putting a electronic fuel injected turbocharged two twelve hemi hemi on a motorized bike. Um, <laughs> whoo! Uh, you got bigger brass than I do, so I can say that's cool. That's cool. I like I like to see that when y'all get done with it. All right, does Havoc make a two seven five six piston that goes on our sixty two seventy rod? Um, because I'm under the impression I've never dealt with Havoc. Um, I've seen their stuff. They got you know the pistons. They got nice pistons. Um, really good quality pistons. But the, all the ones I've seen, um go on the uh or like wiseco they got small wrist pins in them um no i take that back i take that back i seen something the other day um that go with the stock i think they're they're like hemi pistons that they've they look like hemi pistons they're kind of that design and all would maybe some with the top of I, I i forget i think i want to say bullfrog had them you know jeremy parsons i think he had them um that go with our connecting rod so yeah uh, six thousands pop up. I'm not a fan of pop up in these engines, um, at all. Some people like running pop up. You know, if it's a dome piston, that's different. But it's a flat top piston. I just don't like running pop up. Um, it may can give you a little more static compression, but the way I look at an engine, the cylinder, the piston is like a giant syringe. And you know, you ever stuck a syringe 
for medicine. Nothing else for medicine, right? A syringe down in some water, and you know, as soon as you start pulling the handle back, you know, that little rubber stopper comes down and it sucks the water up in it. Um, but if you take that plunger, the little rubber plunger, and push it a little bit past the end and stick it down in the water, it doesn't start moving the water until the end of that plunger, in most cases, depending on what type of syringe you use. It don't start pulling the water until that plunger is flush with the end of the body. So, in my opinion, if you're 6,000 out the hole, 10,000 out the hole, 20,000 out the hole, you're losing 20,000 or 6,000, 10,000 of downward draw when that piston comes down. Um, that's just how I view it. Um, I've never been proven wrong about that because nobody never really tried to, but you know the, the, the studies and tests that I've done, um, you know, using actual syringes, doing that, and, and, and relaying it over to an engine. Um, I've just never been a, a fan of pop-up. Another reason is because with pop-up, you put more pressure on the head gaskets. Um, I typically leave every engine I do at least 10 in the hole. Try to. Um, some of the stocker engines, you know, they may come 5, 6, or 4, or 3. But I try to leave them in the hole. Modified engines, every modified engine I build, you know, whether it's mild modified or outlaw or whatever, they're 20 in the hole. Every one of them, 15 to 20, sometimes 25. I leave them down in the hole. That way I can run a thinner head gasket on it and have less worry about a thicker head gasket, you know, or you know, if you're using two of the metal head gaskets, worrying about them blowing. Um, now, if you're 6,000 out the hole, you can use the, you know, the fire ring style gaskets, um, but I got, a, I got a little problem with them also. Um, the fire ring gaskets, y'all seen them, they've got the metal ring around them, and it's like a fiber material outside of that. Um, what I don't like about them is when you're putting the head on, if you're not really careful and running the bolts down, the, the metal ring is slightly compressible. The rest of the gasket material is very compressible. So what can happen is when you're torquing it down with those fire ring gaskets, the head can actually warp around the fire ring enough to make the valves leak. Um, you don't see that with an animal because the seats and all of them are different. They all run firing gaskets on them, but the clones and the predators, the way the heads are built, um, they're, they will actually flex. And, you know, I've done, I've done demonstrations in the shop plenty of times with these firing gaskets. Um, put them on, do a, a leak down test on it, both the valves are leaking. Just slightly loosen the head up a little bit and they stop. Um, so if you're going to use a firing gasket, what I recommend doing is using two ratchets and top left, bottom right, top right, bottom left. Snug them down, snug them down until both of them are down really hard, as hard as you can do with your hands, and then torque them, you know, crisscross. Um, I've seen people put heads on with impact guns. You do that with a firing gasket, I promise you these valves are going to start leaking. Um, but there again, I like running my pistons down so I can run thin hand gaskets and not worry about stuff like that. A um, little bit long there on that, but <laughs> anyway. Um, let's see. Oh crap! What I do? Okay. Um. Ba -ba -ra -ba -ba. Oh yeah, I was going to say something about these pistons. I was trying to catch my train of thought here. These, um, when you, one thing, you know, I said that you, I was going to, the name of the video is pros and cons of long rod, short rod. All right, when you get these longer rods and these shorter pistons, that moves something I should have said a while ago when I was bumbling around. You know, I'm going to look at this video tomorrow and go, man, was he drunk? <laughs> but no, I'm not drunk. I was just in deep thought. But... Longer rod, shorter piston. You move the fulcrum, you know, of the uh, of the rod up higher on the piston. Too young to see that. There you go. See how much higher it is. And what that does, that can create rock in the piston as it goes up and down the cylinder. You know, when the when it's, when it's pushing it up, it can cause the piston to try to rock that way because the the fulcrum of the the wrist pin is so high that the pressures um, can cause the piston as it goes up to rock outward and when it comes back down it causes it to you know pull the other way and call it the piston we call it piston rock so what I tell people to do with these wise codes 
Um, I like setting my Wisecos, if possible, um, around three thousand skirt clearance, and you know I do the same hone, the same finish, and everything. But with a Wiseco, I try to break them in a little easier than I do a you know a stock engine. Uh, most AKRAs, I crank them up for five seconds, make sure that they run fine, everything gets old. Um, there's no oil leaks. I put the hook it up to the dyno and fire it up and let it sit there and run 3600 RPM so it gets certain temps. Anyway, it's got a constant pressure on it. These engines here, depending on what carburetor I'm running on them, I like to crank them up and let them run for a second. Daddy! Hey, buddy. You doing okay now? You still coughing? Yeah. You are? Yeah. You want to tell everybody hey? Hey. Say hey, everybody. Three-year-olds, you gotta love them, right? <laughs> and live TV. Can I finish now? Finish, please. Can I finish? You finish. I can. Are you gonna close the door for me? Close. Tell everybody bye. Bye. Say later, Gator. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye, bye, buddy. I'll be out in a minute. And he's gone. He'll be back. All right. I'm trying to think where I was at. Oh yeah, piston rock. I try to set it, you know, between three, three and a half on a new engine if possible. Um, you know, because you need to get a rebuild out of it. And after the engine comes back, after six, eight races or whatever, I, I hone it as little as I can, as little as possible, because I don't like getting over four thousandths on, on my piston clearance. Um, because what can happen is you get a little piston scuffing on it. And this piston here probably got 20, 25 races on it, you know, in one of my outlaw engines. Um, but, you know, after the last rebuild, I noticed that it fell off a little sooner than it should. That's because I had a little too much clearance. I was up around five, five and a half, but it was on its third rebuild, I believe. And the piston clearance got up a little too much and causes it causes a little rock. Now you can run, you know, five, five and a half, six thousand clearance on these type of pistons because the wrist pin is down lower and it, it doesn't cause as much rock or not as much force being trying to twist that piston inside the inside the cylinder. Um, so keep that in mind when you go to the wise codes. I always like telling people if you're gonna use a wise code, try to get a new engine, try to use a new engine, new block. Or one that has been run very, very little, so that you don't have to do a whole lot of hoeing to it. And yes, I hone new engines when I get four foot pistons on. I take them out, buy dial bore gauge them, put them in my oven, or if I have to, whatever, to get the cylinders like I want them. And you know, hone on them enough to get the finish I want, the size I want, but not too much because I, I, I like to keep the clearances, you know, around between three and three and a half on these wise codes. I have opened these up to about four, you know, four and a half um, on new builds. Um, that I just, something to help the engines last a little longer. Now, as far as these three ring pistons, I treat them just like a two ring um, because, you know, you still got the same wristband height, you know, and it's gonna cause a little bit of rock if you got too much uh, clearance on it. So, gotta get your, your clearances, clearance, clearance. Uh, set them around three, three and a half, and you should be fine. And you should be able to get, unless something catastrophic happens, you run, you know, your filter comes off and your engine gets filled full of dirt, or, you know, something bad happens and scalds up the cylinder. You should be able to get two rebuilds out of it if you're careful. Um, you're guaranteed to get one. Um, but any, anytime you go over, four and a half, maybe five thousand for that Wiseco, you, you're going to start seeing some elevated wear in it sometimes, especially with our stroker kit, because the stroker kit is 175 thousandths longer stroke, and the rod ratio is a little bit shorter in it because of the extra stroke. Um, I definitely tell people to start with a brand new block and, and maybe go up one piston size from what you are so you can set it at a, if it's not out of the block where you can lightly hone it and set it at you know three three and a half um, because uh, any any time 
you, you get the piston rock out of control, it, it can cause, it's not going to cause the engine to blow up or anything, but it can cause the rings, you know, scuffing on the side of the piston and stuff like that and cause the rings to lose a little bit of seal down the road. It ain't going to happen first race, but it just may not last as long as it should. Okay. Jeff, I use the original gaskets on my modifiers um, all the time. Um, and of course, I don't build no, you know, I ain't got you no know, big three inch engines, you know, that run stock head gaskets on them. But, you know, my outlaw engines that I build, they're either, you know, stock bore or, you know, 20 or 30 over. Um, but I use the standard OEM Predator metal gaskets and the standard OEM clone metal gaskets on them all the time. And have zero failures. In fact, the engine that um, you know you mentioned a while ago about the oil plug that I run over at Robling Road on the road course, it got up the Sunday. It got up when the oil came out of it. Got up to 540 something degrees head temperature. Head gasket was not leaking. Um, it done a perfect leak down test. Cylinder still looked good in it. Um, but yeah, it's all about making sure that the deck is level and the head is level. Because if one is off and you try to put something flat on it, you're gonna have problems. And I don't recommend running at 500 degrees for long because eventually the head will warp and it will <laughs> start leaking. Just reading some, uh, oh, you're gonna put that turbo on a custom frame and all. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I wanna see some videos and pictures that when it get cool. That'd be, that'd be really cool. Um, timing sh don't play a factor in long rod, short rod. Uh, the pistons traveling the same amount of distance. Um, you know, if you're running gasoline, there's a lot of people out there that run gasoline that's running way too much time than to begin with, as far as modified engines. I know on these stock engines, AKRA and NKAs, we run 34, 35, 36, 37 degrees timing on gasoline, which theoretically shouldn't be working, but it does. Um, we question it all the time, but we still do it. Um, but on modified engines that you're going to be turning 7,000 plus, 7,500, 8,000, I don't go over 32 degrees. I rarely get to 32 degrees. Um, a lot of people are running too much time. And the methanol, typically we run anywhere from 34 to 38, depending on what kind of carburetor we're running. But timing, you know, these longer rods and all, it shouldn't affect the timing any. Um, you know, and like I say, unless you're running gasoline. I hadn't seen that it has anyway. Um, if you're running a, a 6218 one-inch tall deck animal, yeah. <laughs> you got some stroke in that one, don't you? Um, you know, I probably wouldn't go over about 36 on methanol with that. You know, 32 on gas, but yeah, that's a, that's a long stroker there. <laughs> Yeah, give me a call. We'll, we'll, I don't know much about turbos or EFI, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm a naturally aspirated guy. That did not sound right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know anything about EFI. Very little about turbos, but I'll be glad to help you, you know, get some parts together, some, you know, you know, durable modified parts that would help you out there, man. Just give me a call. Thank you, Henry. I think I'm cute also. <laughs> I know you're talking about my kid. Uh, yeah, the instructions on the rod, you know, I shoot for 3,000s. That's just, that's something I've done way before I even came to ARC. You know, yes, I build engines before I came to ARC. That's, <laughs> you know, I've been building for years and years and years on my own and with other people. Um, but that's just what I've always used was 3000s. And I'm one of those people, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, I, I've done hear people, some say four, some say two. The man that designs and makes the rod says, you know, if the crankshaft drum is perfectly round and everything is in place right and you're running the proper oil, 2000s is fine. He makes the rod, so I will tell you that 2000s is fine. Um, but uh, yeah, two and a half to three and a half is theoretically, 
in most people's eyes and in my opinion and in my experience ideal um four thousandths is still okay you know um running the right oil when i say the right oil all of our billet rods in the instructions say that these rods are designed to be used with a medium weight oil i say oh yep there it is right there on the very last page that probably nobody ever reads I know it's backwards, but it says it right there. Medium weight oil, which is, you know, around a 30 weight, which is what our Lucas is, you know, or a Thor medium, you know, or a cool power medium. Um, they rec recommend to be run with medium weight oils. And um, that's why I say 4,000 is okay, because they're designed, you need to run a little thicker oil with, it, with extra clearances. Um, four and a half to five, you're pushing it. Um, what's going to happen there when you get up to around five thousandths is the bearing is going to wear the babbitting on it is going to wear a little bit quicker. Uh, quicker. Um, it's going to have impact marks in it. It's going to wear it out, and the and, it's, and the more it wears, the more clearance is going to open up in it. And when that clearance gets, I keep saying Clarence, like I'm calling somebody's name. That's how he sounds all country. He says Clarence. The clearances will open up. And that will allow the crankshaft to get a running start and hammer this rod. And what that's going to do is going to hammer it this way and hammer it this way. And at 8,000 RPMs, that's like a jackhammer on the end of this rod. And it's going to wind up breaking the bolts off of it. Um, so, yeah, clearances, clearancing, clearances are important. Um, you know, two to four, two to three and a half is, is you know, fine. Two and a half, three and a half is ideal. Four, you're pushing it. Um, anything over that, um, it's just, you're just asking for trouble. The two thousandths, according to the manufacturer um, and the designer and manufacturer of ARC billet connecting rods, two thousandths is okay. Just, uh, you know, break it in slowly. Actually, it says, it shows you how much I actually read this thing here. Actually, it says clearances should be no less than two and no greater than four. Um, but yeah, two thousands is fine. I just want to make sure that that is what it said on there. Do I ever see wear because of the wrong oils being used? Well, Jeff, sir, I'm glad you joined in tonight because number one, my mind cleared up when you and Bradley showed up and you're asking good questions. Um, yes, I am going to plug our Lucas Oil here, but the biggest way I see oils causing a problem is a lot of these carding oils that's been around since, and some of them has been around since the mid to late 80s, if not earlier than that. They're good oils, they would still be around. They're designed for methanol, in my opinion. Um, they're great oils, use the flatheads, animals, you know, modifiers with methanol. Some of them, I'm not going to name any names here because I don't come on here to put down any product or talk about any product or any manufacturer or any business of any kind in any way. But I will say that some of those carding oils are designed for methanol and they don't mix well with gasoline. And these clone engines, you know, the stockers and some modifiers run gasoline, pump gasoline or race gas. And what happens is, you know, as the engine runs, uh, gasoline is also used as a coolant, an upper cylinder lubricant, uh, better said. Um, and it hangs out inside the little cross hatches as the piston comes up, then the oil splashes up and it comes back down and it washes a little bit of gas down into the bottom of the engine. That's what turns your oil black. 99% of the time, that's what turns the oil in your car black is the gasoline after three, 4,000 miles, just a very, very little bit, gets in and turns the oil dark. That's what it's designed to do. But carding oil, some of it, don't mix with gasoline well. As long as you keep it shook up, it's fine. But when it cools overnight, it creates this little jelly or the bathtub ring, as I call it. When you open your engine up, you'll see this black line around. That's where the gas and the oil separated after it got cool. And it created this little jelly thing. And I've seen instances here and there where the, that stuff caused problems. But the biggest thing is it just causes gunk on the inside of the engine to form. Um, that's why it's important to use oils that are designed to be with the fuel that you're using. Um, there's several oils out there that mix with gasoline and methanol. There's quite a few. There's a bunch. Um, 
You know, of course, the Lucas is you know our oil that we sell, recommend, and run ourselves. I run it in everything. Uh, the same oil I run in a red plate clone that I run in my modified 390. Same oil. It's 30 weight. It's a medium weight oil. Um, it it you know atomizes very well, um, but it does mix with gasoline, methanol, ethanol, race gas, nitromethane, E85. It mixes with it all. Um, but that's one thing you got to watch out for with these carding oils. Just make sure you're using it with the right oil. All this carding oil, they're they're all good. I mean, they all do their job. They lubricate. They help control heat, but where you run the problems is, is with different fuels. Or if you're using one of these oils and you decide to use somebody else's, sometimes you get contamination, which is where the two oils, you was running Joe Bob's Super Schlickner oil over here and was doing good, but you just want to try something different. They may have not had Joe Bob's in the trailer that night, so uh, you go over here and get uh, Willie J's oil over here. And well, the Jay's got good oil. It runs fine. But when you drain this oil out and put this oil in, they may not mix. And that can cause a problem also. Uh, so I tell people, there's a couple ways you can do it. A lot of people, you know, I always tell them to fire the engine up, get the oil hot, drain it out. Then you can take some, um, some people use mineral spirits. They'll pour a little bit in the crankcase and kind of slosh it around and drain that out and then put their new oil in. What I tell people to do, if you're gonna change oils, get the engine hot, and I mean racing temp hot, 400 degrees head temp, where it gets the oil hot, and the oil is loose and runny and you know thinned out, drain it out, put whatever new oil you're gonna put in there in it, while the engine is still hot, fire that engine up, let it run for a little bit, you know, you ain't gotta go on the racetrack, but just let it run some, and drain that out, and then fill it back up. Um, both ways work fine, but, you got to watch out for oil contamination. Speaking of engine builds, uh, Mr. William, your engine is sitting on the table. Um, I, it seems like I get further behind every single day. You know, I, I go in there and you know, we went off this weekend um, out of town. I should have stayed home and worked, but I needed to get away. So. You know, we went to Mississippi this weekend over to a race, but your engine is sitting on the table and should be started on tomorrow or Monday. Should be, but it's there and I'm, I'm rolling with it. <laughs> yeah, you can only use that as a joke for so long, man. <laughs> then it actually starts offending me. I don't get offended. I'm so you can't offend me. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Was running into cracking rods on the pin down the shaft. Okay, which which rod was you running? Um, because, like I was saying before. Uh, Larry, um, these rods, the 3707s, where you cut the piston on, be careful how much you cut it because that's exactly what I was talking about a while ago. You get the piston, you cut the piston too much. It always helps to measure the piston because, you know, some of these pistons, the ones we sell usually don't have it, not, not the ones that we sell for these common engines like this. I don't think I have one here. Um, no, I don't. But some of these Wiseco pistons, if you look up here in between where the wrist pin goes, it'll have a, a notched out area right here that's supposed to be for older style rods that, you know, had a more square top to it. It gave, you know, rod clearance up in there. If it's got that and you cut 95, 100 thousandths off top of that piston, sometimes those indentions right there are... 50, 60 thousandths deep. So you're 50, 60 thousandths thinner right here in the very center. And you cut this piston down, you turn these engines 8,500, you know, at least 8,000 or more. That creates a weak point right there and can cause this piston to flex more. And when that happens, a lot of times that happens. The wrist pin will break. Um, if you're not using heavy duty wrist pins, 
Um, you know, we sell heavy duty wrist pins. A lot of other places sell heavy duty wrist pins. Um, I really wasn't going to talk about this, but um, some people also use the old Briggs wrist pin in them. You know, the flathead wrist pins. They're good. They're thick. But one thing about them is they're a little bit shorter than the wrist pin that's designed to go in it, which is this one. As you see how, let's see if I can get it up very good, how thick and tapered that one is. It's pretty thick on the outside, and see how it tapers really thick down there in the middle? And that, that thick part is right here in the very middle, which helps with flex. Um, the Briggs pin is a thick pin, hard pin, but it's a little bit shorter. And it can move side to side inside this piston and cause the piston to, you know, wobble like this, which is, you know, piston don't need to wobble. If the piston's going to wobble, it needs to wobble skirt ways, not wrist pin ways. Because what that's going to do, that's going to either crack the piston or it's going to crack the wrist pin or it's going to put extra stress on the rod and, and bust the top of the rod. Um, but just watch out for stuff like that with some of these pistons. I, I don't. Not sure where people are getting them from, but I've seen them out there, and we've got some. Like I say, it's you know some of the, the bigger pistons or, or the older flathead stuff that we got, but these newer pistons that we get from Wiseco does not have that. There is no cutout up there, so you're not running into a thin area up there. Um, I've seen that a few times. You know, I've had a I had a piston you know crack on me several years ago. I caught it you know during a rebuild, but um, it was one of those that was notched out, and you know, I. Didn't measure the piston like I was supposed to and cut too much off of it and the piston cracked. Luckily, I caught it though. But um, watch out for that because that's, that's, that's the number one thing that causes rods to, to break at the wrist pin is either piston flex or the wrist pin breaking. Um, to just, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure what um, rod or piston he was using, but I'm just throwing that out there, you know, for other people to watch out for and look for. Uh, Chris, uh, that Lucas zinc uh, break-in stuff, um, you can actually run it in the engine. It's, it's designed, you know, for bigger cars, you know, for break-in purposes. But, you know, you can you can actually use it to race with. I know people that go buy, I probably shouldn't say this because it could cut down on my oil sales, but, you know, they go buy, you know, Mobile One or, you know, uh, Super Tech or Havoline full synthetic oil and put some of that in it and it, it makes a, a decent racing oil. It still doesn't atomize like it needs to because car oils just don't atomize, you know, real fine droplets like it should, um, which is where the carding oils, you know, excel at. Um, but you can add that zinc additive to just about anything, but I don't recommend using more than about an ounce of it because it does thicken the oil up a little bit. Um, you know, some people use it They'll use an ounce to two ounce, like in their in like 390 engines. You know, the oil they run in it, they'll put two ounces in it because they're running like a medium or heavyweight oil, and they'll put some in it to help thicken the oil just a little bit because that 390, you know, got so much compression in that big journal, it just helps for lubrication. But it, it can be added to anything, and uh, I use it quite often, um, brake ins and racing. It's some good stuff. You just got to be careful with it because it's thick, and it does thicken the oil up. Yeah, I'm not sure about uh, cams for turbos either. I mean, I can find out some stuff for you. Uh, Thor Medium, you know, Robert, Thor Medium's fine, um, you know, on methanol. Um, a lot of people run Thor Medium in box stocks, don't have problems with them, you know. Uh, no, the, now the Lucas break in oil. The actual oil that comes on a quart, yeah, it's 30 weight, but I think he's talking about the zinc additive, um, you know, the little bottle, the little squirt bottle um, that comes with it. Um, and I didn't, like I say, in box stocks and, you know, small blocks, I don't recommend using more than an ounce. A uh, big block you can possibly use too. Um, Yeah, Mark, uh, pins are, um, wrist pins are, are, are very important today. Um, there's some, there's some 
uh, people out here running pens that are they're, they're thin. I don't know where they're getting them at, um, but they wind up breaking a piston or breaking a rod, and it's you know a lot of times it's just it's just the wrong pins. And these overhead valve engines have a lot more compression, and you know, they deal with a lot more stress in most cases than these flatheads do. And that's why these heavy duty pins are very important. You know, we sell these, we've been selling these for a long time. I don't think I've ever seen one fail. Um, part number 6521, if y'all wondered about that. Uh, Dino K. The Dino K is fine oil. There's nothing wrong with that oil. Yeah, Dino K is good oil. Um, yeah, I say I don't get on here and, and talk bad about nobody's products. I don't like getting on here and promote other people's products also. But Dino K is good. It's a good oil. Um, but yeah, back to uh, Trent. The um, the enduro rods that don't have the dipper on them. Most of those are are the flathead rods. Um, you know, he's talking about the forced oil dipper. If y'all know that, you know, our overhead valve rods, clone rods, Honda rods, they have the dipper is a is a scooper and it it goes down the oil and when it hits it it forces the oil up into well right there it comes in the dipper and comes out right there and squirts oil up into the bearing um helps lubrication really really beneficial um on initial startup especially with these high compression Modified engines, you know, flatheads. There, some of them have real high compression. Also, flatheads, overhead valves. It doesn't matter. That engine's been sitting there for three, four, five days. All the oil that's you know inside the bearing, you know, most of it's drained off. There's a little bit left in there, but you reach down there and you got 12, 13, 14 to one compression. You hit that starter to it. This thing um, spins over really fast and fires up real fast, and that forced oil dipper, as soon as you hit the starter and it hits that oil, it squirts oil up into that into that journal to lubricate it instantly. Um, the Enduro rods, some of those do not, they don't have that. Um, the engine spins, I don't know how many revolutions before oil actually gets into these little holes here. That's the oil hole that it's got to get into from splashing around. Um, every rod I put in, flathead, overhead valve, whatever, it's going to have a forced oil dipper in it. Um, some builders say they don't want that. They don't like that. I, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll make them the old way. It's no big deal. As long as they sell, we'll make it. Um, but that's what the forced oil dipper is for. I, I like it on the initial startup. You know, high compression. You spin it. It instantly has oil in it. Like these, you know, Mark McNutt was up here a while ago. I think it was Mark McNutt. Wasn't it? Yeah. You know, he builds big 390s. You know, probably one of the best three big block guys in the country um you know and a lot of compression on these big 390 engines and when you hit that starter it had been sitting there for several days it hits that oil and instantly gets oil up there in it and helps the life of the bearing and the life of the engine um ba -ba 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 -ba. um robert our heavy duty wrist pin is a tapered thick pin um I don't have an original Wiseco uh, wrist pin with me, but that's why none of our pistons come with uh, wrist pins because we use our own pin, um, the heavy duty tapered one. Um, yes, they, in these overhead valve engines, the heavy duty pins are a must. A must, must, must. And you know, there again, you got the people that want to run the Briggs pin because it's thick. It's a thick pin, but. You know, you got a little bit of play in there, and you know, that, that plays an effect on how that piston can rock around in there. Um, but, uh, heavy duty wrist pins, gotta have them. Now, these stock engines, I have never heard of or even seen a stock wrist pin break. <laughs> even these thin ones that we run now, these lighter weight ones, I. If there's one out there, I'd like to see it. If somebody's ever broke a stock, you know, clone or predator wrist pin, snatched one out of a piston or actually broke the wrist pin, I'd like to see it because I've never seen one. 
and I've had people call up and say they done it, but I've never seen a picture of it. Um, but there again, that's a lot of weight. You know, if you want something to be sturdy and, and stout and durable, a lot of the times it requires more weight. And that wrist pin weighs a lot. And like I was telling you earlier, you know, on the outer end of this rod from halfway from the rod journal out, you know, because of the smaller wrist pin, the smaller a lot of weight piston, you've got between a 25 and 35% weight reduction on this end of the rod versus this. This has got a much bigger wrist pin in it that ain't gonna break. Of course, the heavy duty ones here won't break either, but you got a, a lighter, quicker revving horsepower uh, product that you could, be, you could put in easily. What am I being here? That ain't bad. Uh, Dakota, all my stock AKRE engines and BP engines, mild modified engines, we run 14 ounces of oil. Always have, always will. Um, I've done dyno testing on you know oil amounts and stuff, and when the oil is cold, like you, when you just pour the oil on the engine, say you got an engine on the dyno, even though the engine might be a little warm, you pour the oil in, say you put, some people say I qualify on 10 ounces. My dyno says, until the oil gets hot, and I mean hot enough to burn your skin, you're probably 120, 150 degrees, it shows zero gain from 10 ounces to 12 ounces to 14 ounces. Now, once the oil gets hot, and I mean hot, the 10, 12 ounces does show a little gain, but I don't want to run my engine that long on 10 ounces of oil, risking you know, does it have enough oil in it? I don't know. Um, how much leaves the pan at, you know, at 6,500 RPMs is? How much is suspended in the air? You know, I know it's all still in there, but I just, my dyno says that there's just not enough gain for me to worry about not having enough oil in it. So I tell all my people, my engines, you know, they can run four ounces in it. I don't care because <laughs> I get paid to rebuild it. They blow it up for not running oil in it. Um, but I run 14 ounces in all my box stockers, AKRA, NKA, BPs, mild modifiers. Now I get into my, you know, my outlaws and, you know, bigger modified engines. Depending on how it's built, like with strokers, sometimes I, most time I start out with 16 ounces in it and watch what it does. If it throws an ounce out, then I put 15 in it. If it don't throw none out, I leave 16 in it. Um, sometimes an engine will tell you when it's got too much oil in it, sometimes. Now sometimes the oil that blows out is because of, you know, blow by on the cylinder and that's not good. You know, if it blows out, you put in 14 ounces and it blows out four ounces of oil in 15 laps, 10 laps, you got a problem. Um, most of my engines, you know, less than an ounce, two ounces, usually all night long, um, if that. But um, yeah, 14 ounces. Go back through it. Anyway, anybody got any more questions they want to pop up here real quick? Um, you want me to start over and go back over the beginning again? Because I know it was it was uh, awful and kind of jumbled around. Um, but don't leave that. Alone. Guess who's back? Leave it alone. The cat's back. Stop. Stupid cat. Anyway, um, yeah, long rods, better. Better by design. Now, um, if you don't stop, I'm going to throw you out the window. <laughs> if it ain't my kid, it's my cat. A wife's cat. I don't own a cat. But, um, <sighs> I knew I'd get this question tonight. How are the stock rods holding up in the new AKRA engines? Um, fine. I mean, there's, there's not, people's not having any problems that I know of. 
I mean, like I said, we went to Mississippi this weekend over to um, Columbus, Mississippi. Go over there and run with, you know, hang out with, you know, old Dave Chisholm and, you know, we're going to go over and hang out with Mark McNutt, but he had a, a, a sickness in the family and he missed it. But um, the stock rods over there, that's a quarter mile track and they were turning them 66, 6800 wide open all the way around. I did not see a failure. If they was, I didn't see it. Um, I had an engine come back to me today that had a, a what I thought was my, my first broken rod. Um, like I said, I've been building these engines, you know, for the AKRA like this since you know around 2010, and I don't think any engine of mine's ever just broken one. There's always been something that caused it. Um, they run it without oil. You know, the side cover come loose one night. Uh, there was two engines um, that they got teched one night and they put the side cover back on it. And they didn't retorque it after a heat cycle, and that's the bolt sometimes would back out, and the oil come out and broke a rod nip. But um, there was other issues with this engine that caused the rod to break. Um, but there's not really any rod problems with them. If everything is built right, um, maintained right, and run right, and they understand that you know 7,200 RPMs on a stock rod ain't gonna last long, then you're not gonna have no problem. But you're gonna be fine with your stock rod, trust me. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. Um, you know, we are most everybody here that's in this, there's a lot of mini bikers in here. Um, but the majority of us run on some type of track where we're turning left or left and right. Um when you got ten ounces in it, you're turning sixty five hundred, seven thousand RPMs and the oil how much you're still on the pan, but when you go in the corners, if there's any there, it's gonna shove to the left or the right. Um, I just, I just rather have, you know, enough oil in it that I know is everything's gonna be fine, and you're not giving up any power, you know. Um, not according to my dyno anyway, not no real power. Uh, Alan, the best oil to use is Lucas Carding Oil. It is available at ARC Racing at arcracing.com, part number 9806. That is the best oil to run. Now, since I got to talk about everybody else's oil, I'm going to talk about my oil. <laughs> but the Lucas is all we sell and recommend. A lot of good oils out there. A lot of good oils. Um, but that's just what we sell and recommend. Actually, our Lucas Marvin is a 30 weight. Um, it's a medium weight oil. Um, that's why I like it, because to me, it's a 100% one and done. You run it in flatheads, modifieds, gas, methanol, whatever. You know, 390s, modified, stalkers. Um, it, uh, but the thing I like about it is it's got a dispersion agent in it, which helps it atomize better. It gets into really fine particles really quick and stays in them, which helps them get into these little bitty holes, you know, little bitty oiling holes here. You know, it gets in better and helps lubricate better, but it still protects like a 30 weight. That's that's one of the great things about it. Um, it's thick, but it flows. Oh, actually, it's not thick. 30 weight's not thick. That's a medium weight oil, but it protects, you know, like a thicker oil, but it atomizes very well to get into those small places. Mark, I don't know why they said that they was impressed with our willingness to help. They paid me to, to do that. I don't work for free. I got my hands dirty three times at that racetrack. Three times. And um, they, they, they all paid me very well. They paid me no attention. <laughs> no, I was, I was really impressed with the Mississippi crowd over there. Um, you know, it was a five and a half hour drive for me. And I took uh, David Simpson that works with us there. He's uh, one of our warehouse guys. Uh, we went over there, stayed a couple of nights. Um, the track, you know, the track was big, a big quarter mile track. And I really like riding on tracks like myself because you can really, especially them, you know, UAS, you can really let the hammer down on them. Um, but the, the racing crowd in general, all the racers and the, you know, the parents and the kids and all, it was a really good environment. I mean, I was, I was impressed myself with, uh, you know, how well everybody got along and how well the racing was and how nice everybody was. And, you know, the people that come up and talk with us, you know, and, and um, very respectful, you know, and, and I, I enjoyed being over there. It was a good show to go to, and we're going to catch another one. Um, I'm maybe, 
maybe, maybe, maybe, not promising, maybe looking at going to um, Beaver Creek. Um, I heard Dave Chisholm say something about maybe having a UAS race at Penton. Um, if that happens, I may actually go racing that one because um, that's not a very long haul for me. That's, you know, two, two and a half hours for me. Um, Beaver Creek is six, I think. It's, that's, that's a long way um, to up there. But um, I'm looking at going to one or possibly both of those. If they have one at Penton, I'll may go race. But, um, mm. uh, yeah, it was a good crowd over there, and I was, get away. He's probably going to knock my camera over here. Yep, there it goes. Really? That's him sharpening his claws on the back of my camera. Um, the yeah, Mississippi crowd was great. I was impressed, enjoyed it. Um, may not be that way at every race, I don't know, but uh, I was impressed with what I saw over there. Um, the, the, the want for bigger races, for more races was, was felt over there. Um, you know, they, I don't know how many people of those get to go, <laughs> stop. I don't know how many people, you know, get to come to, you know, the East Coast over here in the Carolinas and run these big races that we got over here, but they, they want a lot more of that over there and they need it. Um, those people work just as hard as anybody else does. Um, spend just as much time and just as much money. And, you know, I'd like to see more promotions go that way. I'd like to see more promotions, you know, hit the Midwest, you know, and, and, and spread out. Because, you know, without go-karts on the track, um, nobody's business is doing good. And I want to see, I want to see carts on the track. I want to see, you know, all of our dealers succeed. I want to see all the businesses whether you're a dealer of ours or, or compete against us. I want to see everybody succeed, and that can't happen without carts on the track, without tracks to run at, without people to promote the races. So, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of promise out there. Look good. Uh, Henry, the cost of uh, the Lucas Oil is uh, $39 a gallon. Um, that's reasonable for what you're getting. And some oils are a lot more expensive than that. Uh, Michael, uh, the clearances on the stock rods um, are the same as I use on the billet rods. Um, two and a half to three and a half. I shoot for three. Um, that's, that's, I do all my rods the same. <laughs> uh, Marvin, I appreciate that. Um, I'll send you some decals or something for... You know, see, I'll send you decals for plugging my stuff, but I plug people on here all the time and ask for shirts or something, and I've yet to get anything. Nothing. Um, I've got a couple of decals for people, you know, that build their own engines and stuff like that, and I have a shelf where I put all that stuff on. Um, but, yeah, I'll send you some stickers or something. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay, um, not the best video I've ever done, you know, I'll admit, first of it is very sloppy. Um, got a lot going on, just trying to, to uh, oh yeah, well see, there I go sticking my foot in my mouth. Um, my man Jeff gave me the Lucas patch that I wear on the back of my road race uh, uniform. Um, they got to look at it all day long, so, uh, <laughs> Good thing it was his patch. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, why do I say stuff like that? But, um, anyway, uh, sorry about the first of the video being so off. I just got a lot going on. Really busy time of the year for us. Um, a lot of engine orders coming in, a lot of, you know, orders going out. Um, you know, business. Business is up and down across the board for everybody, which, you know, which is good. You know, there's business out there. There's races going on, a lot of stuff being promoted, a lot of races coming up in the in the future. Um, this year looks like it's going to be a good year for racing. Things are already up and going real strong. We got, you know, new tire companies coming in, putting up money, putting up races. That's always a good thing. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of more companies getting involved with, you know, sponsoring stuff and, 
you know, like the little thing that we're doing out here in Mississippi, you know, putting up pole awards and all. You know, it don't seem like much, but, you know, racers appreciate every little thing you can do for them, especially, you know, me driving five and a half hours to go over and present it to them in person, you know, and they appreciate stuff like that. And we're looking at doing, you know, a lot more stuff like that, me getting to more tracks and, and doing things, you know, whether I race or not, you know, just going there to, uh, to uh, you know, go help out and show our support. Um, that's, that's, we're going to try our best not to, uh, try our best to get into more stuff like that this year. Jeff, I'm not rubbing nothing in. You know I'm not like that. I'm just, I'm just joking. Trying to get in a better spirit here before I get off, you know, not the zombie, whatever I was at the beginning. He's been waiting to hear from the UAS guys April 29th. Ugh, that's quick. Don't know if I can make that. That's mighty quick. I mean, I, I don't have Unlike other shops, I don't have people that, that do all my carding work or help me do it. I do it all by myself. Um, I weigh out myself. I do my own tires. I do my own setups. Now, I do get David Simpson. I will plug him here. He's the guy that works with us. the guy I took to Mississippi with us. He does help me set it on and off the scales and help me set my front end, you know. But with everything else I have to do, you know, getting other people's stuff going, is that I have very, very little time to work on my stuff. I was actually supposed to race this weekend. I was gonna go down to one of the local tracks uh, with the with the UAS cart and run it some, but here again, you know, two days before I gotta go, something's come up and I may not get to go. But um, April 29th is um, I don't know if I can make that. That's mighty quick for me. I may go and watch, go and you know support and hang out, but I don't know if I'd be able to race. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, I believe Dave Chisholm's the guy you want to talk to about that that Penton. Um, E85 in the clone engine. No, I've never messed with E85 at all. I know a lot of people that have, but I've never messed with it. I need to. I get a lot of calls on it, but I've never messed with it. So, not sure what to tell you on Jennings or anything. Hmm. Alright, folks. Um, I say again, sorry for the Mm, dang, got a lot of messages since I've been sitting here. Sorry for the blubbering up at the beginning of it. I hope I explain things, you know, like Forrest Gump says. I hope I explain things in a way you can understand them. Um, if not, uh, just you know, uh, any questions I don't I don't get to or see here, I'll answer later on. Just leave a question. You know, if something you, you misunderstood, don't quite get, I want to know more about, I'll be glad to answer it for you. Uh, call me at the shop, email me, drop me a line on Facebook, whatever. But um, again, uh, <laughs> not my best video. I will try harder next time, I promise you. Um, but uh, probably going to be a couple, of, couple, three weeks, if not longer, for another video. Um, like I said, this one was last night. I decided yesterday to do something since we just come back from Mississippi and all. Um, but, uh, God, dog it. Always one when I'm trying to close it up. That's fine. I'll answer it anyway. Why isn't there a set of rules by the sanctioning bodies based on engines like the old 14 and a half? Jimmy, brother, you are preaching to the choir here. I would love to see a touring series of the 14 and a half open modifieds uh, like the Big O. That's one of the biggest races of the year. That has become, in my opinion, the race of the year. Um... You know, if any, anybody is anybody that's been in racing, kart racing, any period of time, they want that trophy. That's why you see all the big manufactured kart names up there. That's why you see all the factory riders up there. The big O is something to win. That should open people's eyes. This open modified flathead overhead valve, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you put the money in it, people will come. Um, a lot of people will come even without the money just to run the, the old open stuff. Um, you'd probably have to move it to, you know, an overhead valve type thing, you know, animals and clones and, you know, put the CC limit on or a cubic inch limit and let them go because this flathead stuff, even though there's nothing in the world that sounds like 20 flatheads turning 9,000 RPMs on a track, the stuff's getting hard to find. They don't make the blocks anymore. You can get them here and there. The old blockzillas are getting hard to find so they'd have to move it to an overhead valve type thing but 
I really wish somebody would. Um, you know, we, we would be glad to, you know, get involved with something like that if somebody would, you know, want to do some type of series. Um, that's something that probably motivate me, motivate me to race more, just to run stuff like that, because that's, that's what I grew up doing is the, you know, the modified open stuff like that. And um, I'd love to see it, you know, but I'd like to see maybe four big O type races a year. You know, have one somewhere in the Carolinas, someone like in Tennessee, somewhere maybe out in Oklahoma. Kind of spread it out. Do four big, five big races a year. Maybe one in Florida. I think it would be um, a good thing. But um, I don't, I, I don't know why people don't don't run that more often. Yeah, Jeff. Good video. Yeah, right. All right, um, now I'll try to shut this down one more time. Um, any more questions, like I say, call me, shoot me a message. The next video is going to be um, <laughs> I'm, I got a lot of people that want me to do stuff on 390s, um, do a video on, you know, the 390 stuff we do. 390 builds, this, that, and the other parts and all. My next video might be over that. I don't know. Um, depends on what comes up between now and then. Um, I'll probably get a lot more involved with my Mark McNutt on here <laughs> um, because I go to him sometimes with 390 stuff. You know, he's he's really good at that. Um, but um, I may do the next video on big block stuff, and it's probably going to be three weeks or longer before I do one, I don't know. You just keep an eye out on the Facebook page. I'll let you know when I'm gonna do another one. But um, I need to do one on big block stuff. I'm getting a lot of lot of requests on it. And the big block stuff is getting very, 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 very popular. Very popular. It's, it's really boomed over the past year or so. And um, so I'll do a little thing on the next show on, on the parts that we got for big blocks, new stuff that we've got, stuff that we've had good combinations and yada 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 and um but till then uh appreciate everybody stopping by tonight and watching me fumble through this so sorely like i did and uh we'll be better next time um but thank y'all and y'all have a good evening